I have the honor to, to moderate uh, today's session. Uh, we have an excellent panel with a mix of policymakers, developers, investors, and uh, practitioners. Um, I am I'm quite excited that we are having this session today uh, because of its significance, as uh, uh, Junaid uh, talked about in the starting of the importance of um, knowledge broking. And uh, so, so just building up on that, uh, knowledge exchange and transfer is, is, the, is the key aspect of uh, the Lighthouse project. And this is critical from the, uh, for the energy transition journey because it kind of provides an opportunity to leapfrog the development curve for a, for a new market creation for a, for a clean technology or a disruptive technology. So uh, with that, uh, the objective of today's uh, panel discussion is to hear about uh, the journey so far in Africa on solar power development. Uh, what are the emerging areas of, you know, like which, which requires some improvement? What are the key enablers which are already existing in, in Africa? And, and to get some impressions about India on its journey, how it has evolved as one of the most attractive solar market globally with, uh, with several uh, development challenges which are, which are quite similar to in Africa. So, so without uh, much ado, so uh, I would now start with um, with the panel discussion. The the structure is like maybe um, with the help of uh, the entire team, uh, we have created listed out few questions. So maybe I can I can pose those questions and and the speakers or panelists can reflect for a couple of minutes, and we can see if we can have two rounds of um, this discussion. So uh, starting with uh, uh, AFDB first with uh, Mr. Coffey, because um, uh, he would be able to provide a much broader perspective about Africa as a, as a whole. So, so um, Mr. Coffey, what, what are the, which are those countries which are poised to, you know, like take on a, on a accelerated solar power journey currently in Africa? And what you think are the key enablers for these countries? If you can can elaborate on that, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this panel discussion. Uh, so I'm here to represent uh, AFDB and uh, we have uh, uh, an initiative in uh, AFDB called BZ to Power. And uh, the initiative is uh, to build up to uh, 10 gigawatts of solar uh, uh, generation from now to 2030, and also give access to 250 million people. So Desert to Power covers uh, 11 countries uh, in the Sahel. Uh, 11 countries are Burkina Faso, Chad, Djibouti, Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, and Sudan. So uh, we are focused on uh, uh, utility scale uh, solar generation as one of the priorities, but also we think that it's uh, important to be able to unlock the solar capacity to strengthen and uh, extend the network, not only uh, nationally, but uh, regionally. Uh, as you all know, uh, for the network, uh, when it is stronger, it is more stable and uh, more flexible. In that uh, context, uh, we are now funding the preparation of uh, uh, a big uh, backbone in the Sahel region. Uh, starting from Mauritania up to Chad, uh, which will uh, be 6,000 uh, kilometers long. And uh, along that backbone, uh, a lot of solar parks will be uh, developed. Uh, so that's our agenda in, um, in uh, uh, transmission system strengthening. So, to respond to your question, I think if we want to unlock 
uh, the solar potential is critical that uh, we, uh, you know, we, we face the, the main issue of uh, the transmission system, uh, all the congestion issues, and also uh, all the uh, grid extension issues. Uh, that's one point. We also want to uh, focus on uh, the capacity uh, of uh, the utilities, technical capacities, and also uh, financial capacities. Because in most of the countries, the utility is uh, the off ticket. So if the utility is not uh, in good shape financially, uh, the whole business can collapse. So it's critical that we address uh, that question and uh, it's uh, one of our priority in the visit to power initiative. And also finally, we need to make sure that uh, the enabling environment is uh, you know, uh, conducive for the development of uh, solar power is uh, an orderly manner and also to make sure that uh, we, at the end we have the, the lowest cost and uh, the lowest price of uh, electricity thank you okay great um uh, great mr coffee so i think um uh, the two aspects which you mentioned about uh, congestion and the uh, the financial health of the off taker i think uh, mr manu would be the right person but uh, we will we will come to Mr. Manu in the end because we will like to hear all the panelists first so that then, you know, like Mr. Manu can then frame his responses in context to, you know, like uh, after hearing all the uh, all the participants, if it's fine with you. Uh, okay, so next, uh, um, I would request Mr. Um, Odusu to, to, to share um, particularly about Nigeria. We have heard uh, Honorable Minister, uh, Mr. Zakari uh, speak earlier and talk about the Nigeria plans for solar and broader ele electricity sector. However, it would be very interesting for us to, to hear from you about, you know, like what are the key policy enablers in Nigeria for solar parks and what are the key challenges uh, which uh, you perceive at this stage. Uh, over to you, Mr. Odusu. Thank you. You can hear me. Brilliant. So Lagos State is a subnational. It's um, it's a part of the country of Nigeria. It's one of the federating states, if you will, much like India, where you have a federation of states, but with more centralized control than what you have in India. For example. Today, there's only one regulator in Nigeria that regulates the electricity uh, market for the entire country of Nigeria. And all of the states, all of the separate states, the 36 states are the federal capital territory as well. In Lagos, we think that that has led to a lack of focus in the market and that the market is not growing as well as it should have. For the past um, 10 years, I can say to you that the market has not grown at all. It stayed at the same size, and there are people, and, and it's not serving, it's not serving the populace. So we've looked at that, and we're looking at working within the environment to separate, to create a new Lagos electricity market, right? And then we're going to be developing policies. We've we've currently just published the Lagos State Electricity Policy, or we've just approved the Lagos State Electricity Policy that will be published in the near future. What that's going to do is look at the market and try and determine how best to serve it. Now, before, before um, finalizing the policy, the first thing we did was to do um, an integrated resource plan to look at where the market was, what exactly is the market demanding, look at the infrastructure, try and determine what the infrastructure gaps are, that supplying the market and then try and determine where the resources can be found to also fit into the market. We, look, we took that together and decided we would need to create um, a new market for Lagos. That's going to, it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be uh, uh, an, an, an immediate separation from the rest of the Nigerian market, but it's going to look at how we can grow the market and, and be able to serve the people now. Today, we have um, 27 million people. We've looked at the load centers, about 40% of those people are connected to the grid. That means a lot of them are not connected to the grid. They are, they are in areas where the grid is present, but if you count the number of customers that the um, distribution companies state that they have, then there's a huge, 
there's a huge number that are not customers of the distribution companies, the electricity distribution companies today. So we have to look for ways to serve them. One of the ways is off-grid. It's, it's one of the major ways. Today, from our estimates, about 20% um, of the demand in Lagos is met by grid power, and about 80% of, of the demand is met by self-generated power, which is an aberration and it's an opportunity in itself as we see it. But how that opportunity is being addressed is what we are trying to, it's what we're trying to um, curate a policy to serve. So we will be working with multilateral agencies, we'll be working with investors to determine what kind of policies we should have in place or what kind of support they need from the government to enable investment in the sector such that more people are able to access energy from um, either cleaner alternative methods or from the grid itself, because the grid again today still happens to be the cheapest part of the, um, the cheapest, cheapest supplies to the, to the market. So in Lagos, that's where we are. We're hoping that we can learn from the examples of other jurisdictions like in India to um, fashion out support mechanisms that would, that would serve the uh, people of Nigeria. Now, speaking about OGS specifically, Lagos is an urban area for the most part. It's not, um, it's not a rural area. So there's not huge space that you can go and um, create a solar park in. But we've done a study with um, the World Bank and the BCG to look at Lagos and look at the rooftop, rooftop space and determine how much energy we can generate from there. If you look at um, the supply to Lagos today is, is in the order of 900 megawatts for 27 million people. That's significantly undersupplied. And when we took, um, when we completed that study, it was, it was determined that we could generate up to 11 gigawatts from the rooftop space that exists. So what we're looking at is trying to um, create, uh, to create um, a regulatory environment where people then determine that they want to go and lease rooftop spaces and then put, put, solar, put um, solar panels on there. We're also trying to work with um, the World Bank to determine how we can aggregate demand such that when all of these different solar initiatives start to come to the fore, then we are able to aggregate the demand that they can supply. But we're still in early days yet. The Lagos market is still part of the single Nigerian market. We haven't we haven't fully we haven't started the separation yet, or we haven't started the creation. We're already thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Odo. So it um, sounds very promising um, what you talked about creating the market and and really uh, you know like tapping the low hanging fruits in terms of uh, 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 leveraging rooftop solar and um, so it's it, it it is quite informative. Um, so now I would request uh, Mr. Nagaraja to to um, kind of uh, because we understand that PFAN has uh, you know like significant experience of uh, financing large scale utility projects uh, uh, globally and and in Africa. So if you can uh, share your um, experience so far in financing uh, solar uh, large scale solar projects and um, highlight maybe uh, two or three key critical enablers. Uh, Mr. Nagaraju. Thank you, Abine. Um, PFAN is a program of uh, UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization. And we support uh, private sector capital in <clears throat> enablers into the renewable energy sector across developing countries. Uh, we are actually not in the large scale IPPs. Our mandate is to help the SMEs and, uh, you know, in the 50 to 100 megawatt uh, uh, range. And of course, you know, the impact ones, anything from twin to Pisto onwards. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's PFAN has been around since 2008. Uh, and uh, we have till now uh, assisted uh, in mobilizing about uh, two billion dollars of uh, funding for uh, renewable energy across about 50 countries. Um, with that background, uh, let me share with you one or two things which we did in the early part when uh, solar park uh, parks were being uh, developed. As against the state play, uh, we helped the projects in the private sector. And as you know, if 
money is the constraint then everything is a constraint so we start from there and uh, how to help these people in terms of um, assisting them to um, uh, develop the solar park because the concept is very appealing as we all know so we helped uh, in forming uh, a strategy on uh, a, a, a step by step approach to that the first and the foremost is you know identification of the land and the state support whether you know you have the grid near that or uh, uh, whether you know you, you should not end up with the power back down and things like that so the in any any part of the world we have seen regulator plays a very important role in energy and uh, if he's heavy handed then you know it's a it's a real problem so a conducive ecosystem and environment is a must to start any renewable energy project and uh, given let's say that it is friendly uh, what we did was to support them in terms of land acquisition in terms of long term leases and then land development and packaging the most important thing is numerable innumerable um, uh, approvals that you need so you have that you package the uh, land in terms of say 2 megawatts 5 megawatts 10 megawatts so again you know whether it is an open access or whether you are feeding the grid that is another point and that also reflects upon the points that we talked about uh, uh, this uh, optical risks then also in terms of how to fund the uh, land development uh, power evacuation safety security and all that so it was zoom uh, managed that uh, you can take a sort of an advance from the anchor client something similar to what we now see in the malls you know you have the anchor client you build around that so similar to that and then work with the advances and uh, then you also take advances for the power supply that is possible now obviously you know all this is possible provided you have a good uh, uh, credibility and model and uh, uh, you are near to the grid and the wheeling and banking charges and such things so for the cross subsidies all that should work out but then we spent a lot of time in financial modeling and uh, the sort of uh, eliminating and flushing out the risks from this uh, we also worked on uh, how the supplier's credit is possible um, the you know people who are supplying the equipment so that way we made it that with a little equity from the developer we stretched it to the best possible thing and then did it in phases of 50 megawatts 100 megawatts you know like that so if you get a tenant uh, i mean a um a, 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 the first uh, let us say the person who occupies as a major uh, uh, name in, from the market then it is good and if you are looking at africa you know while the land is there um, accessibility and in terms of regulatory environment and in terms of um, uh, the funding so this can be done in uh, uh, this way but first and foremost you know like uh, what is important is of taker risk who is the person who is going to you know finally uh, pay you for the uh, land parcels that you are going to give so it is a good way of developing is what i would say uh, in the private sector okay thanks thanks mr uh, nagaraja now um uh, I would request uh, Marco to to kind of share his views on you know like how how they see as an end-to-end -end developer um, with blended financing and you know like complete solution provider. Um, how how do you see the the solar sector in Africa would play out and um, and and how how PIDG is is you know like positioning itself uh, in in short to medium term. Thanks, and uh, thanks for having me today. I, I agree with a lot of what, what's been said in terms of the challenges. Uh, we're also very excited about the market. There's a lot that is happening, and there's a lot that we can uh, uh, that, that we've been doing uh, on the continent. So, we've uh, as a group, the private infrastructure development group, operates across the the infrastructure cycle. So we do. Uh, some early stage activities. We got we got TA available effectively, and then we do we have a project development arm, and we have a long term debt arm and a guarantee arm that tries to brings in the commercial finance. So we've got all the blended finance instruments under under a roof, and um, and that is essential for uh, for uh, for solar uh, in uh, in Africa. 
And if you look at the, from a, uh, from a, a business perspective, the development risk profile of the projects is simply too high to be priced, um, where you've got uh, uh, that, that um, uh, level of, um, for example, of, of uncertainty around the off day. I'll give you a couple of examples of countries in which we've recently completed projects. We've, we've, we've completed, uh, and, and it's reaching construction now, a 60 megawatt in uh, Malawi. You're talking about 27% access to electricity. It's extremely low. Um, and we've got a second coming up with a battery energy storage system in the same scale. The, I agree with uh, Mr. Nagaraja that, that, that that's the type of scale that, that works for the size of the market. Um, but there are very few independent developers that can endure the cost and the time that it takes to develop these projects. Uh, and there's, there's, you can count them on, on one hand. And, and I think we, we do need more uh, of those developers. The, and then on, you know, on top of that, you've got the affordability issue. So, you know, you've got high risk, you need to price them, but power needs to be affordable. And, and, and that's a big challenge from the, from the uh, developer side, from the entrepreneur side, but it's doable. With, with patient capital and, and blended finance. I think that that's essential. Another uh, project we're very proud of, which we're working on with the African Development Bank actually, is um, is project in Chad. Uh, uh, so the first uh, solar independent power producer in Chad. And in order to do that, we had to develop the legislative framework for IPPs to operate. And a, a developer doesn't usually do that, but we had to do that. The good news is that that framework is there and it's been replicated and now it can be used for others as well. Um, but it took about six, seven years to develop the project. That is an awful long time. And we still didn't get that, that financial close, although we, you know, I think we're close. But, um, but in order to do that, you know, who can endure that type of cost and, and time? Very few, very few entities. You need that patient capital. If you're looking at the debt side, you need really long-term debt. And there's not many who are providing that level of debt. So I think the, the, the finance piece is, is, is difficult for two reasons. One is you've got, um, you know, you've got a big, uh, so lenders don't have a big risk appetite really in, uh, in Africa at the moment. And there are, there, the opportunity cost is, is huge. So you can invest in other things where you will get your returns faster. And why would you take the time to do all the work on the initial due diligence, et cetera, on, on these projects? Again, you either need a, a specific mandate or you need somebody to do it and prove it and then others can come in which is the type of work that we're trying to do uh, and for private uh, commercial banks what we're looking at is um, uh, um, guarantees that can extend the tenure of banks who can come in and do these projects and so one example of this is Mali where we've done uh, a, a large so well not a large solar but still in the in the region of 50 60 megawatts uh, but it's large for the area and, it, and it's, um, it's operational at the moment and we use both long-term that it's privately operated uh, um, IPP um, and we use both long-term that and guarantees to allow commercial banks to come in uh, into that and this type of instruments I think are, are, are those that are needed but we do need more developers on the continent in my view um, and, um, and, and we do need this type of solutions to, to demonstrate that a lot of the risks are, are, are perceived rather than real. The last thing I want to say is our debt fund uh, has been investing in Africa for 20 years in, uh, in you know, low income countries, fragile countries. Our, our loss rate is very low. Uh, and it is because if you are, if you are building the, the local partnership and choosing the projects, well, it, it is feasible and it is possible. And I think the market is moving. I think it's a good, good time to invest in a number of projects. And this, is, this is about the on-grid and the grid tide event. I, I really like the, the remarks about CNI and off-grid opportunities by uh, Mr. Dusotep, but uh, that, that's another area we're involved in, but I believe it's not the topic of today. Right, um, Marco, that was very, very insightful. Um, and I think um, 
that's a that's a very great uh, segue to to Mr. Shrivastava now, um, because uh, uh, all the the previous speakers have kind of you know laid the ground in terms of uh, uh, you know like laying the the kind of key challenges around off taker risk, land acquisition, power evacuation. And, you know, like, uh, and Mr. Srivastava, I would like to just, you know, like mention a few words about him because he, he is, he is uh, one of the champion in the country for uh, promoting rooftop solar sector where it is now. And his role, particularly in Riva project uh, uh, is, is incredible. And, and we have worked very closely uh, as World Bank with uh, with Mr. Manu and and I think uh, all the participants here now can really benefit from from his reflections about the journey of Riva Solar Park, but also broader solar park development, and perhaps addressing uh, the questions which were raised by by the previous panelists. Just before going to Mr. Manu, um, uh, Mr. Franklin message that he has to leave for another meeting in, in, in a minute. So, so uh, Mr. Franklin, if, if there is uh, a last few words you would like to share, perhaps particularly referring to or responding to what uh, um, Mr. Marco mentioned about, you know, long-term patient capital, which, need, which is the need. And as, um, as, as the Development Bank of Africa, uh, maybe if you can, uh, if you would like to say a few words before you, you leave and then we go to Mr. Manu. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think um, the two projects, uh, Mr. Marco refers to in Chad and Mati, uh, uh, one of them is uh, in the Visit to Power Framework. And uh, it's clear that uh, has to be a comprehensive package. You know, working in countries like uh, Mali and Chad, we, which are fragile countries and uh, complete affected countries, uh, it's very challenging. Uh, sometimes their main focus is on security and they need handholding in terms of putting in place all the structures needed uh, to be able to, to, to crowd in uh, uh, private sector financing. So this is what we are trying to do uh, as the FDB, uh, in advising the governments and also in trying to put in place uh, a comprehensive package in order to help them uh, develop uh, their potential. But uh, I agree that it's not an easy game. Okay, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Franklin. Uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Manu. Uh, thanks, uh, firstly, for uh, having invited me. And this is an area about which uh, uh, I'm quite passionate. And it's always uh, very nice to share uh, uh, learnings with each one of us. Uh, firstly, I would like to say that uh, 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 we are at a, a moment in history when uh, solar is actually cheaper than all other sources of uh, energy that we are using. Uh, I have had an occasion to uh, work with uh, what World Bank is doing uh, in some in many African countries, and I have actually analyzed the cost of power in most African countries. And the interesting part is that the present cost of power that is being used is more than the prevailing cost of solar. Now, what really needs to be done is that the solar project has to be set up well. It has to be structured well for the prices to come down. And therein lies the challenge. It has been discussed by uh, numerous speakers. But essentially, firstly, we have to got the fundamentals clear that what is our goal? Our goal is a, I don't think there is any uh, utility or any country which is in the financial space, especially in the covid uh, scenario to put in financial resources for setting up solar project. So we can't expect sovereign governments, utilities to put in their money for that. So we want basically projects where private finance comes in and provides power at cheap rates. And the target should be that it is at a rate cheaper than the prevailing rate of power. So I would say that if you have to structure a good project, that is the basic definition. The basic definition is that 
you expect zero investment on behalf of the government or the utility and that the rates of power provided by the private uh, investor should be lower than the prevailing cost of power. Now, to do that, we have to structure a good project. What I can assure you is that uh, we were also in a situation, I, mean, I must share uh, that, that when India started on this path and the project Riva that uh, has been talked about, when that came up, the scenario in India was that the general thinking the prevalent world view or the pre prevalent mindset was that solar has to be more expensive than coal-based power, that solar needs subsidy. Without subsidy, uh, solar would not be viable. And even with subsidy, solar would still be costlier than coal-based power. That was the mindset that uh, India had and all projects in India were coming up with this mindset. The federal government was giving subsidy. Even with that subsidy, the cost of subsidized solar was more than the cost of um, coal-based power. So the utilities had to be pushed through law to use some bit of solar because uh, the solar was uh, the subsidized solar was also more expensive than the cost of coal. But with good project structuring, by taking care of the risks and uncertainties of uh, developers, of investors, of taking care of the risks and uncertainties as far as the bankers are concerned uh, so that we could make sure that the uh, expected return on investment or equity was low because there are investors who are keen to invest uh, at very low rates of interest. They want that their investments are assured. They don't want phenomenal returns, but they want their uh, returns to be assured that is why they are more keen on OECD countries than perhaps developing countries. So the idea is, I mean, you can't, one can't convert India or uh, some country in Africa into an OECD country overnight. But the challenge is that how can you ring fence the uncertainties of the projects in the developing countries in a country like India and a country in Africa? Uh, how can you ring fence the uncertainties and to reduce the uncertainties risk sufficiently to make large number of developers interested in the project and to have those investors who are keen to uh, invest, who are keen to uh, put in their money with the assurance that the money is, is safe and uh, then they would expect lower rates of uh, return on the equity. Uh, then very importantly, most projects these days, only 30% is equity. The remaining 70% is debt. So one has to convince the bankers that their money is safe, that they are investing money for a long time. I mean, in solar, we talk of a 25 year project. Debt is not usually for that longer period, but if we are aiming for a debt of 15 or 20 years, then uh, the, the lender has to be sure that the money is safe. And only then would we be able to get money at low rates of interest. So these are the two uh, crucial points that the uh, equity, it should have a low rate of uh, uh, expectation of low rate of return and the debt, the interest rate should be low. And for these two things, the fundamental um, uh, bedrock for that or the fundamental reality to achieve that is basically to de-risk the project, to make the project viable and to uh, reduce the risks, uncertainties of the project. How do we go around do that, uh, doing that? That is the challenge. So. One of the first things, numerous things have been discussed by uh, the speakers before me. Uh, the primary thing I would say, one of the things is land, for example. Land belongs to the sovereign. To expect a developer walking in from France or Japan to India or some country in Africa and to be arranging land is difficult. They would always rely on local partners who would have cost. It is much simpler for the government or for a government agency to... Uh, uh, arrange for land. So I would say that one of the first things that is as a sovereign uh, owns the land, it should be the responsibility of the sovereign, the government to arrange the land. And for that, firstly, I suppose we have it's the most important to for everyone in the system, the government, the regulator, the utility to have confidence in the project that if they do this, they would end up making zero investment and making a saving from the, uh, day, uh, day one. So really, I mean, See, our, our slogan has to be simple. 
if the slogan is very complicated, if we're trying to sell uh, the concept of the ice in Antarctica melting, uh, melting to someone in Lagos, I don't think it's going to work. I mean, though I, I have a deep concern for the ice in Antarctica melting, but to imagine that the utility in Lagos or in uh, Rajasthan in India is really bothered about uh, the ice in Antarctica melting, apart from when they are watching BBC news in the evening when they get back from office, I think, uh, and that's not happening. We have to convince them on the economic viability of the project. It's only when you con convince uh, people on the economic viability of the project. If you, if you have a message is simple that we are getting you a project where you have to make zero investment and you make saving from day one. That if, unless the, the message is as simple as that, I don't think we are getting the, uh, the attention and the interest and the support of all the stakeholders in the country. So that has to be our message. And when that happens, the numerous things, uh, land and similar thing is with evacuation infrastructure. Evacuation infrastructure needs right of way, which becomes very difficult for a developer from some other country. Payment security, someone rightly pointed out, the situation of the utilities is not good. I, I can say that when I'm saying this, I'm not saying from any uh, position or from a higher uh, uh, podium because the, the, the challenge of the discoms in India are well known. They have very poor financial ratings. Uh, so, for example, in the project that I implemented, uh, our discoms had a similar challenge. So we had to convince our government that you support the discom discom is your baby so if the discom makes higher losses you suffer so if if discom procures cheaper power you benefit so we convinced our government to give a government guarantee so the government gave a guarantee a sovereign guarantee that if the discoms don't pay on time then uh, the uh, uh, the, the, gov the government would pitch in and would pay the solar developer. So it is one of the new, a very important reason why the cost would come down. But for that to happen, you have to have the confidence and the attention of the government. Uh, only then would government give you this uh, sort of a guarantee. Uh, there, there could be some uh, countries uh, which have a, a challenge regarding security, etc. And the sovereign guarantee might not be sufficient. So then we can have, MIGA can come in. World Bank is offering a guarantee for that. Another very important part is that the, when the developer comes in, if you have a tight loan, if you win our project, then you have, uh, it could be a multilateral agency, IFC has done it. Uh, it could be uh, uh, willing to consult African Development Bank could do it. There could be organizations from with whom you arrange a tight loan. But if you win our bid, then at the end of it, you would get a tight loan. So there are numerous such things uh, that can be said. I'm not sure Abhinav, if I'm exceeding the time that you had in mind, but the basic point is that you have to uh, reduce the risks and uncertainties. How we do it is, is a long thing, but the short point is I think we need two different entities. One is the solar developer who comes in, puts the uh, investment, puts the panels, uh, does the project, but there has to be some other entity which sets up the project. The project proponent has to be someone different, distinct from the project developer who comes in the finance and the, uh, and, and the solar panels and who supplies power 25 years. That has to be different. We have to be, have a separate project proponent, a project developer who develops the project, who, who identifies the land, arranges the land, arranges the evacuation infrastructure, arranges the procurers, uh, arranges the policy, the regulations. So when the developer walks in, everything has to be ready. The policy, the regulations, the land, uh, the procurer. So only then, so then only then would we have a true plug and play that everything is ready and a developer walks in and he knows that the land is here. We have a tied up procurer. The documents are in place. I just have to get finance. I just have to put in panels. I just have to supply. The risks are mitigated and then I supply for 25 years and I have the assurance of getting my returns on time. So there, had, there is a need of separate project proponent. I understand that ISA is trying to play a role in that. Um, the World Bank is trying to play in, uh, a role in that to help countries uh, identify and a strong project proponents and, and, they, and to hand holding has to be done by uh, say ISA and, and World Bank for, for, for this.
I'm, right, I, I'm right. not thank, here. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manu. It was um, quite insightful. And I think you have laid out the building blocks uh, for, for setting up the, the large scale solar utility projects. And, and of course, the time is always short. We are just like two minutes behind, behind uh, our allocated time. Just, but just before we close, I would um, uh, request Mr. Uh, Odusu to, you know, like kind of reflect on what uh, Mr. Srivastava explained. And, you know, because of course the, the timeline, like he has tried to, you know, summarize the entire journey in last 10 minutes. But of course the, the whole idea of, of the knowledge exchange is to, you know, like pick up some, some leaves and then kind of perhaps, you know, like may have more bilateral elaborate discussion. So, uh, if Mr. Odusu, you can you can share one or two you know like ideas uh, which which you found interesting today and would like to you know like have more discussion going forward. Thank you very much. Um, I think I may have mentioned that most of the power that's generated in Lagos is from private sources and not from the grid. So that's already demonstrated that the market does not need a subsidy and is able to pay for its own way. Now, the difference between the generators that people have in their homes that's generating all of that power, 80% of the supply, is that it's terribly expensive and people are paying cash for it. Let me give an example um, to, to understand the Nigerian context. In, um, in Lagos, for example, over the past three years, we have bought, when I say we, I'm talking about the market and the residents in Lagos, 8,000 megawatts of diesel generators. Now, that's what you pay cash for. You pay cash to acquire it. 8,000 megawatts. Considering that what the grid supplies is 900 megawatts, and that the newest addition to the grid is a 450 megawatt plant that was bought, that was, um, that a PPA was purchased, that, 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 um, that a PPA was signed, a PPA was signed on about four years ago, about three, about five years ago, actually, is, um, has, has upset the system. It's expensive even though it's cheaper than the privately generated power. The grid isn't able to afford it, yet the market is able to afford very expensive power. That tells me that the market does not need a subsidy. The market, if it was properly organized, is able to pay its way. And those are the kinds of things I would like to talk about now. We have a market that we think can pay its way. We have a requirement for additional power that's going to go into a grid that is currently inefficient. We must then find a way to decouple this market from that inefficient grid, right? And then still be able to demand for additional generation. And, and one of the things we're thinking about is replacing these um, heavily polluting generators with potentially solar systems. We have to then create a, we have to create a market for the solar. And some of the things that have been highlighted as the issues and some of the things I would like to discuss here, for example, financing for solar. We have to look at that and try and understand how to um, explain to the local bankers what exactly solar is and why grid connected solar is, is, um, is going to be a viable way forward. We have to talk about the commercial part of it, which is the demand aggregation, look at the acquisition costs and also raise consumer awareness as to the fact that we're going to be preparing clean energy from, from, um, from um, OGS solutions. We also have to look at the, the environment he had mentioned that solar is cheaper than alternative sources. Now, I don't know that solar is cheaper than alternative sources. I hope that we can sit together and understand how it's cheaper and be able to sell that idea to this market. Because I like the idea of cheap solar. If, so, if solar is cheaper, then, then it means there's, um, there's, it's reduced the barriers to going into solar significantly for us. We also have to look at the supply chain ecosystem. For example, what's the supply chain like in Nigeria? What's a competitive landscape? And I like the um, cheap, cheaper part of it. We have to come up with a, mod a business model that works. And I'm hoping that we can leverage what's been done in India and that Mr. Um, Srivastava will make himself available to, to take us through some of those, some of those um, experiences that you've had in India. And then we also have to then look at um, how to, again, like you mentioned, coach the, dis the discourse as we call them, and you call them discoms, it's exactly the same thing. And, and understand what their capacity is to be able to take on this, um, this um, currently off-grid supplies and, and perhaps have a two-way metering where we can either import power from the grid or export power to the grid from this OGS system. And, and I, I imagine that it's going to be very exciting trying to work with, with work, work through all of these issues to try and come up with a solution. Right. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Odo. So sorry, we have run out of the time. Uh, uh, 
but I would really thank each one of you today. And it was really an enrichful discussion. And, and I think we clearly have uh, some uh, way forward, uh, particularly on rooftop solar for which we will have a separate discussion lined up. Uh, but without much ado, I would now hand over to Ankit to, uh, to take uh, the session forward. Thank you all the panelists. Thank you very much.